Hey, TGS viewers, Chris Nichols here from the Camera Store, and we've got another special episode of Unsung Cameras of Yesteryear here for you today. Now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, check out our last video on the Fuji Finepix S5 Pro. We took a look at this very capable but somewhat venerable camera, and we had a great time with that. And as a side note, if you want to win your very own like new Fuji Finepix S5 Pro, we are giving one away in our contest. Stay tuned to the end of the video, and we'll give you all the details you need to win that camera and call it your own. Now, today, what ancient camera camera we looking at? It doesn't get more ancient than this in the digital world. This is the Kodak NC2000. Now this Frankenstein camera was a mashup between the Nikon N90S in the States or F90X around the rest of the world and a Kodak digital back here. You can see it 1.3 megapixels but very interesting it was the first camera to be made in conjunction with the Associated Press specifically for photojournalism. And as a side point here in Calgary our local newspaper the Calgary Herald was one of the first in the world to go all digital with their workflow using cameras like this. Now I'm going to show you all the parts that we had to put in to make this camera work. It has a few extra bits here. I want to show you guys that next. Now, one thing we have to keep in mind is that the NC2000 is well over 20 years old. I mean, we've got ports on here from my childhood. We've got SCSIs on here and serial ports and stuff like that. And it's actually a very big challenge to make an over 20 year old camera work with today's technology. Now, first off, the original NC2000 used a NICAD battery, if you even remember those. Real pain in the butt and a journalist could not get through a full day of shooting on one charge. But what we had to do, because there's none of those batteries left, is get a very good friend of ours, Ted Wingate, one of our longtime customers, to jury rig something for us. So we've actually got this port in the bottom going right into the board, and it leads to this lithium battery pack with all the accoutrements required. Look at that. Now apparently if we let this go below 10 volts, it may catch fire and explode. It's a lot like the movie Speed, so I'm going to lay that out here. The other thing, of course, is storage. We did try a PCMCIA storage card, but we couldn't find any adapters and computers old enough to download that. Luckily here, we've got our Sandus Compact Flash PC card adapter and a 96 megabyte card. 512 meg cards won't even format properly for this camera. Luckily, our disk utility in our Mac computer was able to format this in such a way that the NC2000 would read it. So we are shooting, we're having a good time. I'm getting about, oh, 66 pictures on this 96 meg card. We're gonna make it work though. This brings back memories. Uh, I never shot the NC2000, but I did shoot an F90X a lot. And of course I sold them in the store for a long time too. At the time, the autofocusing was state of the art, although compared to modern cameras, it's pretty abysmal but uh, I'm going to manual focus a lot today anyways. It's kind of bringing me back and it's fun to do. Viewfinder is great, but keep in mind that you've got these big crop lines because the NC2000 E sensor was first off a 3-4 ratio sensor and also gave you about a 1.6 crop factor. So you just see that represented on the screen. Although from a journalistic sense, that might sound like a negative, but you actually get to see a lot of what's going to happen from the outside of your frame. So I could see somebody walking through in my viewfinder and then get ready to get them in the grid line. So that actually works pretty well from a journalistic point of view. I'm rocking the 20mm 2.8 today, uh, the D lens, I'm rocking the 135 f2 DC lens, and a classic 51.8D as well. And I think that's going to give me the kit I need to get some nice shots today. Okay, so it's time to go shoot the NC2000 just around Calgary, take some photos. But what I really want to do is just kind of go back in time, talk to some of the people who experienced this changeover. This was a really big deal in the world of photojournalists, who were, of course, all shooting film at the time. And keep in mind, a lot of these people were forced away from this media to have to shoot these cameras. So let's play with them, compare them. I'm going to put a roll through here and kind of look at the image quality comparison, and then uh, talk to the photojournalists who actually had to make the switch over. So 
my impression of just shooting with this thing for about an hour and a half now is it's supremely uncomfortable for my hands. Every piece of plastic on here is just hard and sharp. My pinky especially is killing me. The position has to be in. You know, the F90 had a really nice compact grip, but you stick this giant back on it and you gotta have big hands to hold on to this thing. It is not fun at all to carry around. On top of that, we got this cable coming out here into the 10 pin, which always blocks things like your autofocusing control. I mean, there's gaps in here. I don't know, it must be a nightmare keeping dust off the sensor on a camera like this. The only saving grace is at any time I could just unclip this, pull this off, put it back on there and start shooting film in this F90X again. Now, interesting enough, on the NC2000, it's a digital body, but we don't have a screen on the back, so I can't see what photos I'm taking. I do have a delete key on the back here. If I push that, it'll just delete the last photo that I took. Somebody, not naming names in this uh, show, may have accused Mike Drew of accidentally deleting, accidentally deleting photos. I wouldn't even know where the delete button was on those cameras. They're too ugly to associate with. I just wanted nothing to do with them. All right, so this is perfect because we actually just ran into Leah Hennel, who works at the Calgary Herald, right? You've been there a long time. Do you remember using this camera? So I didn't use this exact model. I used the one right after it where it had the digital screen in the back. The 620. Yeah, and it was as awful as everybody says it was. <laughs> oh, um, man. But yeah, like I would use my film camera and I would go shoot my, if I, if I wasn't on deadline, I would uh, shoot all my projects on the film camera so that I wouldn't have to use this and then I could take it to the drugstore and- Get it scanned yeah. or whatever. oh gee. It, it was just awful. And that it's a good doorstop. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, it brings back lots of memories. Okay, do yeah. you want to keep it? Cause I don't know what we're gonna no. do. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the man that I want to talk to is Rob Galbraith. Rob, great to see you again. Hi, Chris. Thanks very much. Now, Rob's been a customer of ours for a long time. You ran robgalbraith.com, very popular photo website, lots of tech stuff on there. And now you're a full-time instructor in photojournalism at uh, SAIT. Yes. Now, I want to talk to you, Rob, because you were also a full-time photojournalist for many, many years, hey? Yes. And you especially got to play with this camera. Here's your old friend, the NC2000. So Rob, really, I want to talk to you about, you know, what it meant as a photojournalist when this first came out. Big change in the industry. But my first question is, did you like this camera? No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. No, there was, there was nothing to like about this as a, as a shooting tool. Uh, what got me excited about it uh, is what it represented about the future, the future of photography. So Rob, before this, I'm assuming that you were shooting film, hey? Yes. Yep, I was a Canon uh, film shooter, mm. and I really liked my Canon cameras. I really liked the <laughs> autofocus capability of them. So that must have been a big change, because not only are you now going to a totally different recording media, and yep. totally different you know, rules and technology, software, all the rest, but also you have to switch brands. Hey, I mean, what was that like? Well, it was an unhappy time uh, at first. I found the cameras very difficult to use. I certainly realized very quickly that you had to get the exposure exactly right. Right. Uh, there was no exposure latitude. It was like shooting slide film, only only worse. There was really less, less wow. latitude uh, than that. Were your other photojournalist uh, compatriots uh, finding similar issues? Yes. Uh, it, it made it hard to do the job on a daily basis, there's, mm. there's no question. And in fact, I was one of, uh, one of those on staff that most actively resisted uh, this this coming change. So even though management had made it clear that this was the direction uh, for the Calgary Herald uh, photo staff, um, I really had kind of had put my you know put my head in the sand. So what really changed it for me was when I was sent by the paper to Rwanda in 1994, um, and I was able to, with the help of the Canadian military, get pictures back on a daily basis by satellite phone. So the bigger wire services had been doing this kind of thing for a while, but mm -hmm. for a mid-sized regional newspaper. Uh, in Western Canada to be able to do this was, was pretty exciting. And it certainly was exciting for me personally. That uh, three week trip uh, completely changed the way that I yeah. felt about this technology. I did not like the camera anymore uh, than I did at the beginning of the trip, but I realized that it was going to empower me uh, the other staffers at the newspaper, as well as, as newspaper photographers everywhere, to provide coverage to their readers that, uh, that is simply un unprecedented. Interestingly enough, uh, fast forward about two years, mm. and when the staff was asked whether or not they would want to make the transition back to film now, every single one said no, that they wanted to stick with the digital cameras. I want to talk about a lot of the issues that you probably would have encountered with these cameras, right? And we joke sure. about them being these, these, these dinosaurs and just, you know, these Frankensteins, but really they, they held nothing compared to what we have today, right? Not even so, close. So true. So first off, disgustingly expensive. Hey, I mean, what did the paper pay for this, remember, roughly? 
Uh, my understanding was that they paid seventeen thousand six hundred U.S. dollars. Jeez. Yeah, and that was in a, uh, a combined uh, purchase with the Vancouver Sun and the Vancouver Province. Which... Right. So it would have been more. <laughs> yeah. Now, batteries. We talked about how sometimes people would put NICADs in here. Uh, you were saying the original battery was a nickel metal hydride, is that right? Yep. But uh, did it last? I mean, what kind of issues did you have there? There was no possible way to get through an entire shooting day on a single charge. There was no way to get through an entire Stampeders football game um, on a single charge. Mm -hmm. So that meant doing things like in my football game example, uh, at halftime, trying to find AC power so you could plug in, uh, plug in the battery and charge it up enough, you hoped, to Just be able to, to get through the rest of the game. <laughs> now, as a photojournalist, I would assume that having very fast frame per second, good buffer rate, those would be essential to capturing those defining moments. I'm assuming this camera was just like a beast, just a speed hot rod, right? Well, you're right that that is essential, but this, this camera would fire along at two frames per second. Yeah. Two frames per second. Terrible color quality, in particular if you were shooting under light that had a big infrared uh, component. Hmm. All of a sudden, the, the the white people in your frames would go a strong purple. Um, wow. If you if you were shooting a fire of any kind, the flames would be a bright purple, absolutely a bright wow. theatrical purple. No yep. aliasing filter, no IR coverage here, right? It's Correct. just letting both of those in. Yep. Well, I took some photos. Why don't we take a look at it, and you can tell me uh, why I'm getting some of these weird colors and stuff. That would be very helpful. Awesome. Sounds like fun. Great. All right, so we're going to take a look at the photos here, but I did shoot a roll of color film today, Kodak Actar 100. I haven't done that in a long, long time. It was actually refreshing to do that. Um, now, of course, the Kodak Actar, great color, no moiré. Everything looks nice. I mean, you know, good detail, lots of dynamic range if I don't want to push it. And these files were just shot, just JPEG scans out of one-hour photos, so they're not great. Right. But, you know, at least we get the good color and the good look. So now looking at the Kodak files here, amazingly, Modern Lightroom here was actually able to import the TIFF files at this, you know, the raw files, but they were wrapped as TIFFs, right? Yes. Yeah, it was able to import them, but the color seems strange. And we look at this example here on Kodak, it's nice and orange, very, very vivid. We're getting this very sort of flat plum kind of color. I mean, why would that be? Well, I think that's in part because Adobe's processing of the raw files, it's not as optimum, I think, as it, as it might be. Right. And in fact, the, the Kodak software from back in uh, late 90s, early 2000s would likely have produced better color okay. from, from these raw files. Now, what's going on here in between all these scenes? We get this sort of blue, green, gold kind of glow in all of our highlights. What's going on there? So, uh, at the Herald, we call that Christmas tree highlights. Mm. And we quickly figured out that whenever you had any kind of specular highlight in the frame, whether it was the kind of pattern you're seeing in the frame right. here, or it was the catch light in someone's eye, that the algorithm that figures out what color that pixel's supposed to be uh, would throw up its hands. So I guess you just have to get used to dealing with some of these weird issues that would happen. I noticed too, if you try to boost shadows rough on this camera, I mean, dynamic range is brutal, tons of noise. Yes. So that kind of makes me think then that high ISO performance wasn't great either. No, and in, and in the original NC2000, ISO, anything above about ISO 400 was really not an option. If you shot at ISO 1600, as I did for my very first Calgary Flames game, right. uh, what I got was pictures where it looked like the players uh, we're playing in a red and blue snow blizzard. It was, wow. yeah, it was Crazy. really, really pretty horrific. The E version of the camera, which is, which is what you've been using today, hmm. it was, it was noticeably better. All right, Rob, I do appreciate your input on that. You know, it's very nice to see. I think the key thing to remember with this NC2000 is it wasn't really about image quality, right? I mean, we're joking about it, we're poking fun at it, but. As you say, this was such an exciting time for photography and for press and this whole revolution of being able to share work, right? It was about the immediacy of it. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. And uh, remember, folks at home, don't necessarily check out robcalbraith.com because he is not moderating it anymore. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, if you really want to uh, talk to Rob and learn from Rob, take a two-year photojournalism course at State. Why not? Operators are standing by. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. All right, guys, so talking to Rob Galbraith about the fact that this camera is missing its IR filter, I can see how that'd be a real pain for journalism, you know? Any sort of fires or bright sunlight or street shots at night, all that kind of stuff, you might have some issues with weird hazes and strange colors. And as you can see in these two photos here, I did have to correct some of these because the color went really weird, especially in these sunny situations. But then I thought, well, why not make the best of it, get an IR filter, stick it on here, and then I took a photo of this tree and you can see that actually we can get a nice pronounced IR effect where normally you'd have to send in a camera to get it fixed that way.
Okay, so we're almost done with the video, but before we go, I do want to mention this contest that I promised you. Now, very, very exciting. First off, I want to say that we have the best, most loyal YouTube followers ever across the world. And one of them, Joseph Nishimiya from Hawaii, has sent us a Fujifilm S5 Pro camera. This thing's in gorgeous shape, two batteries and charger. We're going to give it away to a lucky viewer. Now, Here's how the contest details work. In this video and the next four to follow, I want you guys to look for a vintage camera. It's gonna be an Easter egg. Now, in this one, it was pretty obvious, and just to give you a further clue, it is not gonna be this NC2000, okay? We did use a vintage camera. In the description, you're gonna find all the details for the contest. You're also gonna find a Google form that you wanna fill out. Every form that you do for the next five videos, including this one, you're gonna get one entry. And at the end, we are gonna discover a very lucky YouTube follower of ours who has subscribed and has followed these five shots and videos. They're gonna get a Fuji S5 camera. We're gonna send it to you. So check it out. Don't miss that. It's down in the details below. Now, yes, I know all day today I was complaining about this camera, having used an external battery pack was weird and strange color and it's creaky and uncomfortable to hold, but really in truth, this was a really fun experience. I mean, how many people get to play with one of the first cameras that really started the whole professional digital SLR market? I had a lot of fun with it. A lot of the photos were interesting, but you know, in a lot of ways, they reminded me of Instagram filters anyways, so I don't even have to bother with that. This camera does them right out of the box. Anyway, guys, keep in mind, we enjoy doing these vintage cameras. There's a lot more to come. Don't forget, subscribe to us. Check us out on Instagram and Twitter. Ask us questions about this cool camera. And uh, until next time, see you soon.